I'm really excited. I've always loved school. You don't trust the vaccine? No, I don't trust the Seriously. vaccine. Seriously? Yeah. No, I really, I really don't. But our patience is wearing thin. I don't want that family kept out of school. Adopt um, having these mitigation strategies. We can make sure that our youngest learners are protected. What does it take to get a more in-depth look into the week's top local news stories? The Debrief brings you inside for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our reporters every week, right here, right now. The Debrief. This was supposed to be the time when we finally put COVID-19 behind us, but we remain a country divided by corona. This is not about freedom or personal choice. It's about protecting yourself and those around you. They're going to use this as a jumping off point to start policing our entire lives. The Delta variant has set everything back from travel to a return to the workplace. The Delta variant is currently the greatest threat in the U.S. to our attempt to eliminate COVID-19. It's changing the game and we need to change the game with it. And now there's a new variant in New York City. Could it be an even bigger threat? It is a variant of interest. Well, hello, and welcome to the News 4 Debrief. I'm Michael Gorgio, in for David Ushery. We're going to talk about that new variant of COVID with a pediatric infectious disease specialist. How about if you guys stand? Also, there's millions of kids back in school, but there's different rules everywhere. We're happy to be back. We want to make sure we're coming back safely. Mask mandates, no mask mandates. Districts where teachers must be vaccinated. Districts where they can opt out. Will all this just prolong COVID siege on our lives? Let's start with Dr. Kareen Hadari, Division Director of Pediatric Infectious Disease at St. Barnabas Hospital Healthcare System in the Bronx. Dr. Hadari, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. Tell us about this new variant in New York City in the area. How prevalent is it and how much of a threat is it? Well, it's everywhere, yeah. It's, it's the most prevalent variant right now. It's, it's above 95% of the sequences that we're seeing. And Dr. Hadari, I mean, a lot of people are thinking the only variant we have to worry about is the Delta variant. Are you telling me that's not the case? We are seeing some new variants that are so far less less prevalent than this one. So we're seeing mu, the mu variant um, that is apparent in some st in most of states now. So this other variant now, the mu, mu variant, if to use the Greek lettering, uh, tell us about that and what makes it represent sort of a special threat. We don't know yet if it invades immunity is the most important threat uh, right now. Um, we're not seeing that it's overcoming Delta so far, so that's good. But we are uh, afraid that it might evade immunity, and that's a big problem. Okay, now, how do we have any idea at this point? I know the, the, this variant is new. Do we have any idea of what level of protection the current vaccines offer against it? No, I don't. I mean, we're still working on the effectiveness of the prior on the prior, the prior Delta variant. So the, the, this data will come as as we go. So what, doctor, what can we do in the long term? Because remember, we started with the UK variant. We went to the, Bra the Brazilian variant. And then, of course, Delta came and Delta changed the whole game. And now we have a new one to worry about. So what do you say to people say, well, we're just always going to have a different variant to deal with? Right. So I think what we know so far is that COVID is here to stay, right? So it's kind of become an endemic virus, unfortunately. And we learned that throughout the past year. What we need to do is what we know works best, right? Which are vaccinating as much as we can. So vaccinating the unvaccinated and using the other uh, strategies that we know work. So masking, we know that is a strategy that works. Distancing, we know that it works. Those multi-layer strategies is the most important way to fight this virus. I did a study of the 1918-1920 uh, Spanish flu epidemic and what experts told me is exactly what you said right now. It doesn't fade away, but it fades down to an, perhaps an acceptable level that one can function with it. Now, some governors like Ron DeSantis of Florida just say, look, we're going to just live our life like we do normally, and it's just going to be in the background. Is that really, though, what we're looking at, um, having those number of cases that they have there, or what would to you would be a more acceptable way of moving forward? I don't think that accepting that risk is acceptable, especially in pediatrics. We're seeing a surge in, in the number of cases in pediatrics. And unfortunately, last week we had a record 250,000 cases, which is extraordinary. 
That is not a risk that is acceptable in children. We know that they suffer less from the virus. They're you know, less likely to get hospitalized. Less than 2% of them end up in the hospital and less than 1% end up dying. But even that is not an acceptable risk. We, don't, we should not be accepting any risk. We know what strategies work and we should do everything in our power to, to curb transmission at this point. I'm going to answer the question that I'm sure you get asked all the time. Dr. Hadari, can you give me a timeline? Are we going to be done with this by March of 2022, December of 2021? What's the best science leading us to at this point? I'm not an epidemiologist, and I know that Dr. Fauci estimated the end of the epidemic sometime next, next year. I'm not exactly sure, and I don't think it matters. I think what matters is that we really get these numbers down. And we know we can do that with increasing the vaccination rate of our population, which is why we're seeing a, a less important surge compared to the southern states and the mid Midwestern ones. I want to ask you, because your expertise is in pediatrics, so I want to ask you questions about kids going back to school. So we have millions of school children going back to school all across the United States. Everybody's going back under different rules. Uh, in our mm -hmm. area, kids have to be masked. Some schools, kids have to have immunization. Some areas, there's no mask mandate. There's no immunization mandate. Does all these different rules make it more difficult for us as a nation to move forward from COVID? I think a more unified approach would have been the best approach. So for kids, I think that vaccinating everybody above 12 and vaccinating their relatives, frequent testing, which is, which is sad that a year into this pandemic, we still don't have easy and affordable access to rapid testing, which would really impact the epidemic going forward. In a lot of schools, you will have children who are too young to get vaccinated, but they might be, say, in an elementary school with the older students who are vaccinated. So what risks are there for each group if they're all in school together? There's definitely a risk, but what we can do to mitigate the risk is by really ensuring that everybody around these kids are vaccinated. So teachers, staff should be vaccinated. And again, we should promote testing. Knowledge is power, right? So knowing that you are infectious today morning is an important tool to curb the pandemic because that would allow you to stay at home if you knew that you were carrying an infectious virus. And, and this is done by rapid testing. Um, right? Right. And a lot of schools haven't just spent extra money for remediation and everything to prepare for school life under COVID. Question about testing though and schools. Uh, some schools are offering staff and teachers the option either be vaccinated or be tested perhaps weekly. But as a layman, I'm wondering if I'm tested weekly but not vaccinated, do I pose more of a risk to those around me than a teacher or a staff member who's fully vaccinated? Absolutely. These tests are not perfect. They give you information for that particular day, right? So it's frequency of testing that matters. When we do that just once a week or twice a week, it's not as effective as having somebody vaccinated that is much less likely to transmit the virus. So it's definitely both that we should be doing, not one or the other. Right. But this is often the, this is often the case. People are saying, all right, I'm going to choose the testing option and I'm going to be in front of your child in school. I'm as safe as someone who's vaccinated. I just choose to be tested weekly. You're saying that's not really the right. case. And I think that this is my, a much less safer approach. I think that vaccine mandates are the much safer approach, in addition to improving ventilation, improving testing strategies, universal masking for everyone. We just started the school year in many places. When will we know if we will be able to complete this school year by and large, or whether it's going to be another year like 2020 where the kids end up promoted home? And I know it's different school I to school. Think I think it's only time will tell, um, especially with the new variants coming. I think it's a big question mark and it's going to depend on the rate of infection in these communities. And I think that school districts ha are going to have to make decisions and switch to remote learning if transmission is, uh, is definitely higher. Dr. Hajar, I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Even with all these concerns for most students, this school year means a return to the classroom. And the hope is they can stay there until that final bell rings next spring. Thank you for listening. And we thank our production team, Melissa Mack, Darren Price, and Ben Berkowitz. I'm your host, Michael Gorge. We'll in for David Ushery. We'll check you out the next time on The Debrief. Uh -huh.